Hey, Calvary men, come on out this Saturday to our No Nonsense Men's Conference, where Pastor Nate Holdridge will be sharing what the Bible says about manhood in our modern culture. Dads, if you even wanna bring your junior higher, grab your kids, come on out. We'll be here at the church at 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, and we'll be concluding with lunch at noon. Tickets are just $10 and include lunch from in and out So come on out. If cost is an issue, don't worry about it. We'll help you out. We want every man in our church to be here on Saturday. Hi, I'm Aline. You may remember last year when God called me to lead women's ministry and I shared that eventually I would be stepping down from my role as children's director. The time has arrived for me to commit myself fully to women's ministry, which means we are looking to hire a full-time children's ministry director. The position is a blast and will definitely keep you on your toes. If you have questions about this position, ask me. Or if you're interested in applying, you can ask any staff member for the next step. Well, hey, a couple of things for you to pray about this week. First of all, would you pray for the Beal family? They're heading out to East Germany and they're flying as we speak. The country opened up, their stuff is already shipped, and uh, this is a crucial time to be praying for them. So let's lift them up to the Lord. And also, every week we want to be praying for one of the other churches in our community. So pray for the parish church, for their pastors, Daniel and Kelly, and just for the whole body, that God would be working in them in mighty ways. Well, hey church, open your Bibles up to Joshua 13 as we get into the teaching for today. And we're entering into the second major section of Joshua. The first 12 chapters are all about the victories that Israel has in the land and some setbacks when they're not trusting the Lord and following after him in faith. And now we're getting to these next chapters are discussing the distribution of the land to the different tribes. And then the conclusion of the book, the last two chapters, chapters 23 and 24, are a description of God's covenant with the people, what he will do as the people remain faithful to what he's calling them to. But as we enter into the distribution of the land, I want to take a look at chapter 13. And it's so interesting. We start off this section and, you know, God is actually saying, he's proclaiming, thus saith the Lord, Joshua is old. Can you imagine if that's what God said to you? Uh, I'm reminded of myself. You see, this Wednesday night, I, I went to bed like I do every Wednesday night, not thinking anything about like, oh, what will it be like getting out of bed tomorrow? And I woke up and there was a pain in my knee, you know, and I, the, the amazing thing was I hadn't done anything to cause myself to have pain in my knee. I just realized I'm slowly becoming an old person, right? Like where you just wake up with these pains, you don't know where they came from. There's no explainable reason except for you're advancing in age. And that's where we find Joshua in this time. So uh, I'm not quite as old as Joshua. Joshua probably is around 100 years old here according to the book of Joshua. And our goal today is I really want to make these people and these places that are far away seem close to us. So as we read this section of scripture, let's see ourselves in this story, see what God might be saying to us. So let's start in Joshua 13, verse 1. It says, now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. And there remains yet very much land to possess. And, you know, we don't have to be old in order to come to the end of ourselves to realize that we have limits. And that's what this section's really about for Joshua. He's coming to the end of his resources. He's coming to the end of his strength, his skills, and even his life. And what is being revealed to him is there is still land that yet remains to be conquered. 
there's still promises that are yet to be entered into for him and the nation of Israel. And God's reminding him of this. There's much ground left to be taken for God's purposes. And you might remember at the beginning of this year, there was a strong calling for us to be disciple-making disciples. And as we look at Joshua coming to the end of his life, it reminds me of the importance of God's great commission for us to be disciples that make other disciples. And even here, we realize that We might not be as old as Joshua. You might not even be as old as I am, or you may be a little farther along. But in God's eternal timeline, everyone's time is short. From the youngest person in our church to the most senior saint, everybody has a short amount of time. And the work of God is bigger than any one single person or any single generation that we're called by God. In fact, there's a command that we be making other disciples because we know we're not enough to complete the work of God. We need to be calling new people into this work that God has called us into. And so as we look at Joshua today, I want to be reminded of the calling that God has on your life and on my life to be disciple-making disciples because time is short. Tomorrow's not even promised to us. We should be always bringing into perspective that God wants to work through us. So let's have that perspective as we look at this land of Israel, as we look at the nation of Israel entering into the promised land. And so what we're going to see here in these next few verses is that they're going to be entering into the land. And uh, our goal today is to bring these far off people and places close to us. So I I want to show you this is the, the nation of Israel as we know it today. You might have seen it on a map. And Israel's a tiny little place. In fact, if you compare it to California, right, like look at our our uh, our state. And if you compare California to Israel, you could put Israel in Northern California a couple of times over, right? And so from our perspective, Israel reaches from the bottom of San Francisco to the top would be around Redding and from the coast to somewhere in uh, Vallejo would uh, probably be the width, the, the greatest width of Israel. And so we're going to read about these different places where the nation of Israel has enemies. So in the west is the land of the Philistines. They're on the coast, right? And there's these four different places. We have Gaza, which, uh, you know, would be our modern day tamales. Ashdod would be somewhere around Bodega Bay. Ashkelon, if you know where Salmon Creek is, you know, that's the that's the city of Ashkelon. And then there's these two other cities, Gath and Ekron, and those are right around Two Rocks. So when you're thinking of the Philistines, think of the coast in Sonoma County. And so Joshua 13.2 says this, This is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines and all those of the Geshurites, from the Shihur, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and those of Avim. So here, these are our coastal Sonoma uh, Countyans. Uh, And then we're going to go to the south in verse 4. It's going to start describing for us, this is Marin, San Francisco. But in verse 4, in the south, all the land of the Canaanites. And Mera, that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites. Next, he's going to describe the north, verses 5 and 6. These are the Gebelites and Lebanon. And this is Glen County above us and all the way up to Redding is what you're thinking of. Okay, where are these people in relationship to us in Petaluma? And so it says in verses 5 and 6, And the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon toward the sunrise from Baal Gad, below Mount Herbon to Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Myth. Thoth, Maim, even all the Sidonians. And so picture us right now, we're in Petaluma, surrounded by people who 
don't view the world like we do. You know, for the nation of Israel, these people have vastly different cultures. And this might not be that hard for you to imagine. I think of my wife's experience. Uh, She tells me all the time, she's in the park, she meets a new person, she describes like, what do you do here? She says, "My, my husband, he's a pastor. And she just sees the gears turning in their mind where they think he's a pastor. What does that mean? What does she think of me? Right? And and it just seems like all of a sudden, the moment she mentions that she's part of a pastor's family, they start thinking, oh, this person is so different from me. They see the world differently than me. I don't know if we have anything in common with these people. And so for you, you might have that same experience. Living as someone who loves God, who's committed to him, you might think, hey, like, what do I have in common with these people around us? And the nation of Israel, they're surrounded by all these people who they didn't have something in common with them. But here's what God promised them. God promised that he was going to make a way for these people in the land that he promised to them. And in Joshua chapter 3, the second, it's chapter 13, the second half of verse 6, it says this, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land of Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and the half tribe of Israel. Manasseh. And so what I want you to know is first off is God is the one doing the work, right? He says, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel, that he's not counting on the nation of Israel to be strong enough, smart enough, you know, good enough to do it. What he's saying is, hey, I'm going to do this work and your job is to respond in obedience to what I'm calling you to. And God mentions, right, these nine and then the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh, which are settling on the west side of the Jordan. So for us, it's going to be Petaluma towards the coast, right? So, but that's, he's he's referencing them real quickly, But the rest of our chapter, we're going to be talking about what happens on the east side of the Jordan River. We're going to look at some history. We're going to see that in Numbers chapter 23, the nation of Israel's entering into the promised land. And it reports that there's three tribes. There's Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh as they're entering into the land the promised land, they see on the east side of the Jordan River, they they see this fertile land. They're saying, wow, this is great. We have a ton of livestock. This would be perfect for our families. This would be perfect for our tribes. And Moses tells them, you know what? You can have this land if You promise to go into the promised land with the rest of the nine tribes and help them conquer this area, help them settle into their own inheritance. And so, you know, when it's referencing the east side of the Jordan River, it's talking about these three tribes. It's talking about Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. And they've made this promise to help the rest of the tribes enter into the promised land. And if they do this, God says, hey, I'll establish you here. So then that takes us into the east of the Jordan River. So now we're starting to enter into, you know, Sonoma County. Uh, Well, I'm sorry. We're... So that takes us to the West, but this chapter talks about the Eastern tribes. So this is outside of Sonoma County. Uh, What we're talking about here in in our geography would be Reuben, Gad, and East Manasseh. That'd be, Reuben would be the southernmost tribe on the East, so they'd be somewhere in Vallejo. Uh, Gad would be towards the middle, so we're thinking Napa, Napa County, somewhere along there. And then East Manasseh, they're going to be at the far north of the eastern tribes. So they're going to be all the way up like in Lake County. So that's in our geography. Think about that, you know, on the eastern side of where we live. And so here we see these three tribes here in chapter 13 are receiving their inheritance east of the Jordan. 
So let's start in verse 8 with these eastern tribes. With the other half of the tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses gave them, beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them from Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of that valley, and all the tableland of Medeba as far as Dibon. And all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, as far as the boundary of the Ammonites, and Gilead in the region of the Geshurites, and Mechathites, and all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan to Selica, all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edre, he alone was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. These Moses had struck and driven out, yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Machathites, but Geshur and Machath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. And to the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by the fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, as he said to them. And I, I want you to note two things in this summary uh, of the Eastern land, and we'll return to them later. But the two things are, the number one, they didn't drive out the Geshurites and the Machathites, and that's going to be an issue later on. This is not driving out the, the foreign people is why Israel didn't experience the rest of God. And the second thing to notice is the Levites had no inheritance in the land. It's going to mention this another time in our section of scripture. But let's go on. Now we're going to look at these three tribes, specifically on the eastern side of the Jordan. Let's look at uh, Reuben's inheritance in verse 15. And Moses gave an inheritance to the tribe of the people of Reuben, according to their clans, so their territory was from Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland by Medeba, with Heshbon and all its cities that are in the tableland, Debon and Bamath Baal and Beth Baal and Maon and Jahaz and Kedamoth and Mephath and Kerathim, and Sibma, and Zereth, Shahar, uh, on the hill of the valley, and Beth Pier, and the slopes of Pisgah, and, and Beth Jeshemoth, that is, all the cities of the tableland, and all the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses defeated with the leaders of Midian, Evi, and Rechem, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, the princes of Sihon, who lived in the land, Balaam also, the son of Beer, and the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. And the border of the people of Reuben was the Jordan as a boundary. This was the inheritance of the people of Reuben according to their clans with their cities and villages. And so you'll notice it mentions Balaam. Balaam, we saw was uh, a prophet who was hired to curse the Israelites. He couldn't do it as they were wandering in the wilderness on the border of the promised land. So instead of cursing them, he gave their enemies this advice. Hey, I can't curse them because God won't let me, but what you should do is send your people in there, intermarry with them, bring in your pagan practices, and that's the way that you can overcome the Israelites because we can't just defeat them or curse them. And what we see is they're mentioning, hey, Balaam, who lived in the area that Reuben was settling, he was finally overtaken by uh, in battle. And so Reuben, remember, they're in Vallejo. They're south on the east of us. And now in verse 24, we're going to look at the, the inheritance of the tribe of Gad. So Moses gave an inheritance also to the tribe of Gad, to the people of Gad, according to their clans. Their territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half of the land of the, of the Ammonites to Arer, which is east of Rabbah. And from Heshbon to Ramath, Mizpah, and Betanim, and from Mahanaim to the territory of Deber, and in the valley, Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Succoth, and Zephon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, having the Jordan as a boundary, to the lower end of the Sea of Chinneroth, or that's also known as the Sea of Galilee, 
eastward beyond the Jordan. This is the inheritance of the people of Gad according to their clans with their cities and villages. And so we see Gad is our Napa, right? So they're just they're just above Vallejo, just above Reuben in the Napa area. And then looking at the half tribe of Manasseh's inheritance, and Moses gave an inheritance to the half tribe of Manasseh in verse 29. It was allotted to the half tribe of the people of Manasseh according to their clans. The region extended from Mahanaim through all Bashan the whole kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, 60 cities, and half Gilead, and Ashtaroth, and Idre, the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. These were allotted to the people of Makur, the son of Manasseh, for the half of the people of Makur, according to their clans. And so, you know, they are our uh, our most northern tribe on the east they're they're settling in lake county right and so this is the description of all the kings and the the cities that they're conquering and then we come to the conclusion of our chapter so we see we have these three tribes right they're settling on the eastern side and the conclusion is in verse 32 These are the inheritance that Moses distributed in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan east of Jericho. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. And so once again, we read about the Levites, right? The the tribe of Levi, it says they don't have an inheritance in the land, but God is is their inheritance. And so what I want to to talk about now is what does any of this have to do with us, right? You're like, okay, there's people, they're over there, they're in Napa, they're in Vallejo, they're in Lake County, they're settling, right? But what does that have to do? Well, I want to tell you what this has to do is specifically the Levites. Look at the Levites. What is their calling? What is their inheritance? It says they have no inheritance except for the Lord God of Israel. He is their inheritance. That's what he promised. And you know what? You and I are just like the Levites today. You might be thinking, all right, like, what's God doing with me? Like, what's my inheritance? You know, like, what should I be doing? Where should I be investing? And I want to tell you that you ought to invest in that which will never pass away. Invest in eternity because you're called, just like the Levites are, not to have an inheritance in the land, but to have an inheritance which is God himself. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And what I want you to realize today is that God has an inheritance for us, but it's the same inheritance that the Levites had. In fact, our calling today is the same as the priests in the nation of Israel. We're called to be ministers of God's good news. We're called to lay up for ourselves treasure, not on this earth, but treasure that's in heaven that lasts forever because you're chosen by God, you're commissioned as a priest. And what I want you to know today, as you're reading the story, you're like, where do I find myself in this story? Who am I like? Well, you know what? You're called to be a priest, just like the Levites were called to minister to the people around them. And because... God is doing an eternal work. There's promises that apply to us. In fact, there's one promise that the nation of Israel never got to experience, and that's the promise of God's rest. Do you remember 
how we read about how they failed to get their enemies totally out of their land. And as a result of that, they never experienced the true rest of God. Well, you know what? The book of Hebrews tells us about that promise of rest that's yet to be entered into. If you look at Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through 13, I want to read you this whole section. For if Joshua had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest that, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so as we read of these faraway places and faraway people, I want to tell you that they're much more relevant to us today than you might imagine. That there is a close and present message of God, a promise of rest and a commissioning of priestly service that each one of us is promised and called into. And we're living right now and if you're trying to build an inheritance for yourself, if you're saying, hey, I want to lay up, like I want to invest in something that's going to be worthwhile. Well, you can build an inheritance here and now, but God wants you to invest into an inheritance that lasts for forever. He wants you to know that he is our inheritance, just like he was the inheritance for the priests, that we're called into that same priestly duty. When we talked about at the very beginning of this year, at the very beginning of this message, that our calling, our commission is to be disciple making disciples, I want to remind you that that's still the work of God. It was back then. Joshua realized, and thus saith the Lord, Joshua was old and advanced in years. He had to be thinking about the next generation. And each one of us, whether the youngest person here or you're the oldest person here today, you need to be thinking about where does God want you to invest? Who are you pouring into? How can you be first a disciple that's following after Jesus, that has entered into his rest, that is investing into the eternal work of God? And next, who does God want you to be investing into? Because we're all called to that priestly duty. We're all called to be disciple making disciples. And yet, right, you can look around you and start saying, okay, who is God wanting me to disciple? Well, step number one for us is to enter into the rest that God promised for his people, is to first be a disciple. So if you haven't surrendered your life to God, if you're trying to make things happen on this earth, if you have an inheritance that you're like, okay, like this is my kingdom that I'm building on the earth, then you need to surrender that to God and first be a disciple. And then the next thing is enter into his calling, enter into the rest of God where God promises he's going to make a way for the nation of Israel and for you and that's the work that we're called to enter into. Being a disciple who makes other disciples is the work of God today on the earth. Entering into his rest is the promise that's available for those who see him and seek him by faith. That Joshua and the nation of Israel didn't see it, but God says we can. And so my encouragement, my challenge to you today is we're all old in terms of how much time we have left, right? Our time is short, whether the youngest or the oldest of us is sitting here today. And so let us be busy about our father's business. Let us be busy about doing the work of God 
and entering into the work that he's called for us. And so for you, church, for me, as we look at this chapter of Joshua and we see, hey, there's people and places that are afar off, and yet the promises and the work of God are right here today. So let's enter into that work. Let's be disciples who make other disciples. Will you pray with me today? God, as we seek to follow after you, my prayer for our church, my prayer for myself is that we would seek your kingdom first, that we would rest in the promises of God, and that we would look for opportunities around us to invite other people in. I pray for those who are listening to this right now, God, would you touch our hearts? Would you turn them towards eternal things? And would you help us be busy about the work of God here on the earth? Praying and asking this in Jesus' name, amen. We just spoke about how God worked through the nation of Israel and how God wants to work through you as a priest in his holy work on the earth. And so our application question, no, our application, dang it, it is. Ah, man. Okay. We just finished looking at Joshua chapter 13, how God was working through his people then and how he wants to work through us as his priest today. And our application question is twofold. Number one, how are you being a disciple today? Is there something in your life you need to surrender to God to be a faithful disciple? And number two, who are you discipling? Who do you need to reach out to today and share with them the good things that God does in your life?